Hello and welcome to GameSack. We're talking about some unfaithful arcade conversions. Yes, we are. Remember back in the day before the internet, you'd go to the arcade and you'd play a game, and then you'd see the exact same name on a game coming home to your console, you'd be like, oh, what? This is coming to my console? And you'd maybe buy it, and it wouldn't, wasn't the same, and you're like, what the? What's, yeah. It's either a completely different game or just stuff was not right. You yeah, know, basically you know. like, a good example is like Shadow Dancer on the Genesis. I've talked about this one before. The arcade was one way. Uh, the Genesis is still was a ninja game. It still had the dog, but it was basically a different game, even though it was still a platformer and stuff like that. I like the Genesis version better, by the way. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, games like that is what we're talking about today. So without further ado, let's get on with it. Rygar was released by Tecmo in the arcades in 1987. This is a pretty fun action platformer where you take control of the legendary warrior Rygar. He's resurrected from the dead to rid the land of the evil beast soldiers and bring peace back to Argul. To do this, he has his ancient weapon called the Disc Armor which acts pretty much like a yo-yo. You throw it at your enemies and it comes back after you kill them. You can throw this thing in front of you or if you push up you can do a circular attack which is helpful against flying enemies. One interesting play mechanic is the ability to jump on your enemies' heads. This doesn't hurt them, but it also doesn't hurt you, and it can be helpful when there's lots of enemies about. There's also tons of stuff to collect in this game. These little stone shrine things can be broken open for goodies. They also pop up randomly as you're playing, but don't stop to collect everything since each stage is on a time limit. Once the timer reaches zero, then yeah, this big ugly head thing comes after you, so run! Run! Speaking of levels, there's about 29 of them. At the end of each, you don't fight a boss, but you do get graded for your performance and just move on to the next. It's a pretty fun quarter muncher and you should head right down to your local arcade after this episode and try it. The same year, Tecmo released Rygar for the NES. This game is similar but mostly different from his arcade cousin. You still play as Rygar, of course, and he still has his disc armor for a weapon, but you can't press up for the circular attack anymore. Side-scrolling levels now have a lot more height, and you'll be climbing ropes and whatnot to get to higher areas. Also new are overhead levels. These are easy to traverse and really connect the side-scrolling levels. Some action RPG elements have been added to the game to make it feel like a deeper experience. Things like being able to acquire new weapons like this grappling hook here. Why it's called a weapon? I don't know. This is a very nifty little tool that lets you get to higher areas in a level if there's no rope available. Even if you don't see a platform above your head, just shoot the grappling hook upwards and maybe it'll hook onto something. And of course, you'll also increase the amount of life you have throughout your adventure by killing enemies. Speaking of enemies, they're plentiful in this game, but most of them are really easy to defeat. A fun little thing that you can do if an enemy is pissing you off is to take advantage of the NES's hardware limitations. Once an enemy comes on screen, just go far enough away to make him disappear. When you go towards him again, poof, he's gone, erased from existence. This is a helpful trick at times. They also added boss fights now which weren't in the arcade, but even the easiest boss can be a pain to defeat. It would have been nice if they had a life bar or something. The bosses take a lot of hits and at the first boss I was wondering if I was even doing any damage since all he did was flicker. Eventually I killed him, but there wasn't much satisfaction in that fight. And just so you don't get lost, there's these giant bald guys that'll give you tips on where to go or what equipment you need to progress. I think the game looks pretty good visually. The color is good for the system and there's even a bit of parallax scrolling. The music has lots of different melodies, but they're pretty annoying at times and they grate on my ears so I can't really say I'm a fan. Rygar on the NES is a decent game. It's one of those titles that I don't love, but I don't hate it either. I think it's worth playing to see if it's something that you might like, but as for me, I don't know if I'll ever play it again. I think I've gotten as much satisfaction out of it that I think I can get out of it. Robocop from Data East was released in the arcades in 1988. You of course play as Robocop in this walk and gun game that's nearly indistinguishable from the movie itself. It's pretty slow paced, but it can actually be kind of fun. Sometimes you get a weapon power up and all of your weapons can be aimed all around except for directly below you. When you get into close quarters with an enemy, you have a melee attack, which is just usually you punching them in the face or their special region. In fact, the game starts out this way until Robocop decides to draw his gun from his leg and then you use it for the rest of the game. 
You have a life bar, but honestly, it can drain pretty fast. But hey, that's what extra quarters are for, right? Every once in a while, you'll get a chance for some target practice at the range. I don't know why, but I actually kind of enjoy this. The graphics are nice and typical for their time, and the music isn't objectionable. There's also lots of voices from Robocop taken from the movie, and that's pretty cool. Thank you for your cooperation. Overall, it's not a top tier game, but it's definitely worth playing a few times. In 1989, Robocop came home to the NES again from Data East. I have no idea why, but for some reason they thought that people hated jumping, so they took away Robocop's ability to jump. And that just helps make the game feel very restricting. The stages are also all completely different. However, like the arcade, Robocop draws his gun randomly in the middle of stage one. Unlike the arcade, though, he doesn't use it for the rest of the game. In fact, he'll just pull it out and put it away at random points. Insert your own joke in the comments. Anyway, supposedly this is because Robocop can't have the gun out in certain situations. This doesn't really make any sense because he'll often put the gun away in an area and keep fighting the same enemies he was just shooting up. Speaking of enemies, why is Robocop fighting dogs? And moreover, why are dogs attacking Robocop? What kind of world is this? Poor dogs. You have a life meter as well as an energy meter. You have a very short battery life. It's constantly draining and you might as well think of it as a time limit. The stages are now mostly very large. You still move slowly through them, but this time the stages are almost maze-like. For example, you can go into some rooms and out the other side and you'll appear down the hall. Some rooms will even have items like a new weapon. Or maybe they'll have a bottle that will refill your life or your time. Regardless, you want to pick these up anytime you see them. The weapon upgrades have limited ammo, but your normal weapon is unlimited. To be honest, I don't see much of a difference between the weapons themselves when I use them. When you die, it's game over. You only have one life. Now, you can continue a few times, but you start again from the very beginning of the stage. At the bottom right corner of the screen, you have Robocop Spidey Senses. The fist will flash if you can only defeat an enemy by punching them rather than by shooting them. The little disc thing will blink when there's an enemy nearby. Your face blinks when there's a weak wall that can be punched through. Yeah, because that makes sense. And the battery icon blinks when you're running out of time. Honestly, I usually ignore the spider senses unless there's a wall to be smashed. At least they kept a shooting range in here, though it is slightly less exciting this time around. Overall, I gotta say that the arcade game is much better than the NES version. I mean, I kinda like being able to jump and stuff. The NES game is kinda boring and it would benefit from having more lives before you get a game over, and maybe even some checkpoints. This is the arcade version of Strider from Capcom. This action platformer was released in 1989. It went on to take lots of quarters from lots of people, including me. It's no wonder why, as the game is very fun. Hiru is a really cool looking character, and the way he kills his enemies with his sword is awesome. I always loved the way the enemies exploded when they died. The game features some cool level design with lots of jumps that would make me wonder if I was going to make them or not. There's also a lot of variety in the backgrounds that you fight on, which helps make the game more interesting. The soundtrack's pretty good and it changes several times per stage. It does a good job of climaxing just at the right moment to add the feeling of grandeur. All in all, this is a great arcade game with some solid action. In that same year, Capcom USA released a version of Strider on the NES. But the problem was that the version of Strider that got released was very much different from the one in the arcade. The game that came home is an action platformer, but it has more fetch quest type gameplay. When you're playing a level, you can't access everything. Like barriers, for example, will have a number on them. You need the correct keys to open these barriers to be able to progress. And of course, keys are found in other levels, so that means you'll be going back and forth quite a bit. Not only keys, but you'll need other items like these water boots that let you walk on water. And you'll also collect floppy disks to analyze. 
These disks are very important and hold true secrets that can change history if they're leaked. Here you control similar to the arcade game, but there's one new move which is a triangle jump. Basically when you jump towards a wall you push in the opposite direction and jump again and you can get to higher platforms. It's a very useful and necessary move but until you master it it'll piss you off to no end trying to do it. I spent a lot of time trying and failing and almost gave up but I didn't. I eventually got it and you know what you can too. You have some health points that can get knocked down pretty quickly by your enemies. But as you're wandering around you'll level up when you talk to certain people giving you more health points. As far as graphics go I like what they've done here. It's got nice colors and the backgrounds are nice too. You'll notice a fair amount of the same enemies from the arcade game although their sprites are much smaller here. And of course the music while way different from the arcade is definitely Capcom in feel and that's not a bad thing. One bad thing though is once Hiru dies it's game over immediately. Luckily there's a password that you can learn and it's not too bad to punch in. I like this password not only for being able to start where you left off but because it updates you with a bit of information so you don't feel lost. Say for example your parents come in and make you do dumb chores like take out the dumb trash all the way to the dumb garage then you have to turn off your Nintendo because you have to do these dumb chores. Then you come back and like where was I? Well don't worry because the game lets you know exactly where you were so you don't feel like you've lost progress. So yeah this game is definitely a change from the arcade but sometimes change isn't bad. I used to not like this game back in the 90s because it wasn't the arcade version but playing it now I'm having a really fun time. Definitely pick it up if you don't have it already. All right, Joe. So RoboCop, huh? Not not very good translation, huh? Not really. Not no. even from a mediocre arcade game, I guess. The arcade game's not too bad, but no, the NES game is much much worse. Yeah. What about the movie? Have you seen the movie? It's indistinguishable from the NES game. <laughs> awesome. Indistinguishable. No, no. The movie is awesome. In fact, I ended up watching the movie after I played the game because I had to get the Sweet. bad RoboCop taste out of my mouth and get <laughs> yeah. some good RoboCop taste in there. That's probably the best way to do it. RoboCop. Anyway, more games. Enduro Racer from Sega looks like a cool arcade game. Yeah, I know it's a game you probably don't want to hear about, but I don't care. I want to talk about it. Anyway, you race a motocross style bike against the clock hang on style into the screen. You're often presented with jumps and obstacles that you need to clear. Unfortunately, the game is really difficult as the obstacles are very tough to avoid. The jumps are often on a curve and you need to magically stay in the curve while you're in the air. If you don't do it correctly, you'll fly outside the turn and likely land right into a roadside object which causes you to explode and die which eats up a ton of time off the clock. You even need to be careful how you land on small jumps where no obstacles are present. Or God forbid you land outside the track on the water stage. There's a lot of different things that can screw with you and the game does have a big learning curve for a racer. It also doesn't give you much time to reach a checkpoint so that doesn't really help much either. But the graphics are really cool for their time and the music is also pretty catchy. It can definitely be fun but often the frustration outweighs that because even if you mess up just a little you might not make it to the next stage. But hey with only 5 stages perhaps the challenge is justified. Checkpoint. When Enduro Racer made its eventual appearance on the Master System, they didn't go with a hang on view like, you know, Hang On did. Instead, they went with an isometric view. The game now has no turns whatsoever, but you can veer left or right a little bit on the track. There are tons upon tons of jumps, and these will usually slow you down a little bit. Fortunately, it's a bit easier to navigate through the obstacles. Instead of checkpoints, the game is now divided into individual stages. There's a total of 10 to race on before you beat the game, which for the most part is pretty easy to do. There are only 5 individual stages and after you beat stage 5 the game loops but is slightly more difficult. Between rounds you're graded on your time and how many enemies you pass and you're given points to spend. I usually just buy the accelerator and that's always been good enough for me. The D in the bottom right corner of the screen stands for your bike damage. If this goes over 99 it's game over. 
The damage sticks with you from stage to stage, and there doesn't seem to be any way to fix it as the screen doesn't tell you exactly what's damaged. You can and will crash, either in a fiery explosion or sometimes even sink in the water which eats up a ton of time. This game was literally cut in half compared to the Japanese version which has twice the memory. Not only does it have a cooler title screen, but all 10 stages are unique. Even some of the stages that are in the US version have more roadside objects for you to plant your face into. This one loops just like the US version, but that means you get a total of 20 stages instead of just 10. It even has a cool progress map, kinda like OutRun if you didn't make it to the goal. Thanks Sega for cutting our version in half, we really appreciate that. I mean, nobody wants the whole game. So is the home version better than the arcade? You know, it's honestly hard to say. The music is here and it's still catchy and the graphics aren't horrible, but I definitely miss the cool super scalar graphics of the arcade version despite its crazy difficulty. The Master System could have done an into the screen style port if they had wanted to, but the developers chose otherwise. I'm gonna rank them both equally, but neither really achieves greatness. Here's Dragon's Lair by Advanced Microcomputer Systems released in 1983. At the time, we all know how arcade games look graphically. They were pretty crude and rough around the edges. So you can imagine my wonder when I first saw this Laserdisc based game. I've said it before and I'll say it again, this was like playing a Saturday morning cartoon. A fully animated cartoon that you could, well, kinda control I guess. You play Dirk the Daring trying to rescue Princess Daphne from Mordrak's castle. The game is basically a bunch of cutscenes and it's your job to push a direction or the action button at the correct time to advance to the next scene. It was very tough at first figuring out what the heck to do. I would die and die and then I would die some more. The game had many death sequences. Part of the fun was just watching Dirk die in many different ways and watch his body turn into a pile of bones. When I would get stuck at a certain area, I would watch other people play the game and learn from their mistakes and successes. Eventually I got pretty good at the game, but I don't ever think I beat it in the arcade. Still, it was amazing for its time. <laughs> the NES got a version of Dragon's Lair in 1990 courtesy of Motive Time and Sony. As you'd expect, it's nothing like the arcade game in terms of gameplay. Sure, you still play as Dirk and you're still trying to rescue Princess Daphne, but other than that, it's a completely different game. And this is a game that you can't play quickly. Every move that you make is calculated and you have to memorize levels and enemy patterns. Although Dirk is stiff as a board, he does control better than he looks. Now wait, I'm not saying he controls great, but it could be worse. Firstly, the controller layout is annoying. The jump and action buttons are reversed and there's nothing you can do about that, so just get used to it. Dirk has a life bar in this game, but a lot of the enemies that he encounters kill him instantly, which makes you wonder why the life bar is even there. The Lizard King and Bass are among the few things that'll take life from your life bar and not kill you instantly. And the Bass are the most annoying thing in this game, and it gets to a point that you just let them run into you instead of trying to kill them. You have a candle that's used for multiple things. By pressing the start button, this activates the candle's power. You can press it at certain times to reveal hidden items like this A icon here, which stands for an axe. Get this, as enemies take half the shots to die compared to the standard dagger weapon. And of course, a candle is handy in dark places. It does have a bar that drains, so don't mess around and keep moving. That is once you learn the pattern. So yeah, pattern memorization is your friend. Not very many people like this game, but if you know how to play it, it's not that bad. The Super Nintendo also got a version of Dragon's Lair in 1993, again by Motive Time and published by Data East. And again, this game is way different from the arcade and even way different from the NES version. This time around, you can run and jump as fast as you want and you don't have to be as calculated in your moves. The levels are much bigger as well and some have multiple exits. Some of them take you back to levels you were before and others to new levels. Dirk controls very floaty in this version. When he's running, if you let go of the directional pad, he'll slowly wind down to a stop. It takes a while to get used to this mechanic and frankly I don't like it, but at least you have good control over him when he's jumping. Besides his projectile attack, Dirk has a sword that he can use to dispatch his foes. But the problem is that he can't swing his sword while jumping or ducking and there's many times that you'll wish that you could. The graphics are nice I think and the sprites look great. The backgrounds are well drawn and are mostly very colorful. 
I like that they tried to include little things from the arcade like the castle intro here. The music is completely unnoticeable and unmemorable, but it's there. In the end, neither of these home versions are amazing. It's not surprising that these two games are so different from the arcade. In fact, there wasn't a somewhat faithful port on a console until the Sega CD version came along. These cartridge versions do have moments that are entertaining, but overall I just can't recommend either of them. Just download the arcade version. It's available for almost everything these days, including your phone. <laughs> Bionic Commando was released in the arcades from Capcom in 1987. The rule in this one is that you can't jump at all, ever. To get around this, you have a bionic stretchy arm that can grapple you to different platforms. You can fire it straight up, horizontally, and even diagonally. You can also use it to grab items if you want. You do have a gun, but you can only shoot it horizontally. Speaking of guns and items, you can get weapon power-ups and other things that just give you more points. All you really need to do is make it to the end of the stage and move on to the next one. There's no boss fights waiting for you at the end of the level. The game is an absolute quarter muncher and it's very easy to die. One hit and you are dead. Though you can restart right at the same spot. I like some of the level designs and it's usually fun trying to get around and make it to the end. Though some areas are extremely tricky, like how the hell am I supposed to get up here and get past that? It's, it took me a while, I just basically had to bump my way through by bouncing off of things. Nice graphics and some decent music round things out with this one. When they brought Bionic Commando home the next year for the NES, they changed almost everything except for the playstyle. Now the bads have a secret plan of some sort and they're going to execute it. Super Joe from the original Commando tried to stop them, but he failed. <laughs> Guess he wasn't very super. Anyway, now you need to rescue Super Joe and finish the job. The story was changed completely from the Japanese version where it's about the Nazis doing Nazi things and it should be no surprise at all that this was changed. Anyway, you basically have the same moves as you did in the arcade and you still die in one hit, at least you do initially. And there are no continues and no passwords. As a result, this game feels overwhelmingly difficult the first time you play it. You're still trying to reach the end of most stages, but now there are radio rooms you can enter to communicate with your base. You can also wiretap the enemy's communications here. Use these to figure out what you should do and where you should go next. These rooms also serve as checkpoints when you die. Before each mission, you get to choose which items to bring along based on what you've obtained from beating previous levels. In fact, this right here adds a lot to the game. Also new is the map where you choose which stage to go to next, making everything very non-linear. And if a truck intercepts you on your way to a new area, you get a cool sub-game. This is an overhead run and gun similar to the original Commando, and these were not in the arcade version. These are pretty short, and the only thing you really need to do is make it to the truck a short ways up the screen. The cool thing is, is you can still fling your bionic arm around to help you out. As you progress, you'll gain segments on your life bar which will allow you to take extra hits. Farm these up as soon as you can as they are quite literally a lifesaver. By the way, how are these guys parachuting through solid rock? You'll especially need the extra life for the boss fights which are also added to the home version. The boss fights all take place in the same room and require you to blow up some big thing, but it's still a nice addition from the arcade. It can be tough getting around the various stages. In fact, you can't even move over small boxes without using your grappling arm. You'll need to become really efficient at this to navigate some of the later areas in the game. Sometimes there are courtesy springs that the enemy builds into their floors just to help boost you up if you need it. Thanks, guys. But these springs can also be a hindrance when you're trying to get somewhere. This is not a game that you'll quickly acclimate to. It takes a lot of practice and familiarity with all of the areas. I like the graphics here in this game. There's a nice variety of different areas, and they all have a pretty good amount of detail for the time. Most of the music is also pretty good. Now, there's not a ton of it, but what's here is quite nice. So, which version do I like better? Definitely, absolutely, the NES version. The arcade version is nice and all, but the NES version is a much better design game that will give you much more enjoyment if you stick with it.
All right, and there you have it. Those are some examples of games that were not exactly faithful to their arcade counterparts. And mm -hmm. originally, Dave was going to be the one to cover Bionic Commando, but mm -hmm. he didn't want to. He wanted to cover Dragon's Lair or yeah, well, some other stupid game that he covered. It is so different. So I, I took it. And you know what? I, it was a game I never thought I'd cover, and I really mm -hmm. ended up liking it a lot more than I thought I would. I love the NES version of Bionic Commando. And that's wonderful to hear you say, being a Sega fanboy, that you usually like a Nintendo game. Oh, definitely. So that's that's good. Yeah, and the arcade version's not too bad, but still. No. Yeah. I've heard that before, that the people like the NES version better than the arcade. Well, they should. Yeah. Anyway, what are some arcade ports that you feel were not exactly faithful you know, when they came home. Let us know. In the meantime, thank you for watching GameSack. Dave, the Genesis is truly the king of the arcade conversions. They have some of the best arcade conversions ever made. Really? Uh, you're going to have to prove it to me, Joe, because I just don't believe it. Yeah, Dave. Like Ghouls and Ghosts. Ooh, that is a good one. Or Strider from Capcom. <laughs> Definitely better than the NES version, that's for sure. Super Hang On. Hmm, not bad, not bad. Mercs. Well, it's a one-player game, so if you don't mind playing with yourself... Miss Pac-Man! 16-bit power! T2, the arcade game! Uh, I think the arcade game's definitely better. Fantasy Star 4! What? In Sector X! Oh, Alright, I don't know where you're going now, but that's not good. And Hard Driving! Joe, you know what, I'm just gonna stick with my copy of Bionic Command because overall it's just a better game in general, better than the arcade, and better than your stupid arcade ports on your Genesis. Bye. Purchase a Sega Genesis today!